well. We have quite a lot to discuss today. <laughs> I don't even, what am I supposed to say? How am I supposed to open this? Well, yeah, so we Star Wars last night. <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of Star Warsing to be had. There sure was. Um, I just rewatched the episode too before. We oh, fantastic! On, so it's Same. Fresh in the mind. Mm-hmm. I have I have some notes as well. Perfect. So, I'm, I'm gonna get my notes because I have like two pages of notes. <laughs> yeah, but what an episode! Thanks, everyone. First of all, thanks everyone for joining us on the stream last night. That's probably one of the bigger ones that we've had, and that was fun. It was fun to have some engagement. I think you know that's a good format going forward. Even if I'm mm-hmm. not here next week, uh, I think you should still still jump on. Um, I think that's like a, a fun way to do it. You know. Yeah, and it's just it's it's cool to do it in real time with everybody as as it's happening. You know, especially like if. If you come back later to the channel um, to watch the videos, it's like, yeah, the reaction's fun, but nothing really compares to that fresh in your mind, it's happening now hype, yeah. you know? Yeah. And I, I love those experiences. It's part of why I love Star Wars Celebration so much is because you get to go and celebrate the thing that you love with a bunch of other people who are thinking exactly like you. Amen. And I really enjoy that format for that yeah. reason. So thank you to everybody who came out to our yeah. live stream last night. That was amazing, and I had so much fun. Yes, that was really fun. Also, it's good for a dummy like me who's in there. Sometimes I have questions, and I'm like, what is that? And then people can answer. Let me know. Somebody posted, did you see that that TikTok I posted on our Instagram with that scene of, like, Phyllis and Kelly? No, I didn't see that. Oh, my God. It was the, t- it was the scene from The Office where they're watching Glee, and Phyllis is like, who's that? Who's that? Which one's Glee? <laughs> <laughs> and somebody like put that with like all the Star Wars Rebels characters would be like, who's that? It's like Hera. Who's that? Chopper. It's like, which one's Ahsoka? <laughs> and it's like somebody who didn't watch Clone Wars and Rebels. Accurate. Accurate. But yeah, that was really fun. Um, hopefully. What an episode. Subscribed. Yeah. I was like, what an episode to stream too. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I, I was expecting a, a good one. Were you? I mean, I kind of thought this is when things are going to pick up. I was uh, expecting. And this is why it's important to like you know let a couple episodes go before you start judging it too much, which I think we're generally pretty fair about. You know, I generally mm-hmm. think we are. We'll uh, we'll wait and hold our judgment before we get too far in. There's still a lot of episodes to be had. We have four left. Yeah. But um, you know they they had a lot of setup they had to do. I think before we got to something like this, the meat and potatoes. Um, and I have some I have some thoughts on that too, just like pacing wise for the season mm-hmm. overall. But I mean, this one was great. It was peak Star Wars, one of the best Star Wars episodes we've gotten of all the Star Wars shows as of late. I think personally, I would definitely agree with that. Yeah. As far as Star Warsiness goes, I think that there are two other moments that got me this hyped up. Maybe not quite on the level of the Mandalorian Luke Skywalker reveal. Because I don't know if anything is going to get on that level. Like that is, yeah. that was a perfectly executed moment. And they knew that, like they knew how to build the hype. And honestly, that's like top five Star Wars moments for me. And I don't really know if anything is going to live up to that. But the second I would have to say would probably be Cad Bane's reveal in Book of Boba Fett. Mm-hmm. And then. That was also big. Just getting Hayden Christensen back. I cannot describe what the appearance of that man does to me. Like I feel like I become this child going oh my god it's my hero it's my hero <laughs> like yeah so i i mean like it was definitely hype but i did not expect anakin this soon i thought for sure that that was going to be an episode five thing because there are a lot of rumors going around that episode five is going to be really big like it's oh, a I'm huge sure. episode for this yeah, series I mean, talking about news right now uh, uh, they're doing limited screenings across the country in some big cities los angeles atlanta chicago new york which are all a lot of them are pretty much sold out like the la one sold out in a couple minutes so i didn't get to <laughs> to grab any tickets although i probably wouldn't have been able to make it anyways yeah um but yeah they're doing like a mini theatrical release and they have like a theatrical poster for it which you know that tells me it's going to be probably pretty huge. one of the biggest anticipating- episodes yeah, and I I would expect that. I would think coming off an episode like this, which was really well done, they're just building up to like you know a, a million different things, which we can get into with theories. Um, but we can kind of save that maybe towards the end um, before we get into what our theories are. Yeah, definitely. But- Genuinely, though, I think that I think that the next episode is either going to be like entirely flashbacks. Like I think we might get some insane scenarios now that we are in the world between worlds 
we could see so many different things play out. And I think that we're going to see a lot of familiar faces. And I think that we might get some hefty Clone Wars flashbacks in next week's episode. And I think Uh, that's why it's getting so hyped up because we have now seen all the footage from all of the trailers. Like we're done with those now. Yeah. And we have no idea what's in store from episode five to the end of the series. Which is great. I like that. Mm-hmm. I want that. I it's great. Want... It's great for building suspense. It's perfect. Also, another good thing I'm happy about, Maroc is no longer in the picture. Good. I don't think, I think he was a red herring anyways. You know, kind of like a... Well, he was the red he- herring for Anakin. That's for sure. Yeah. Or what do they call it? A MacGuffin? It's, I don't know. Whatever. Like, he's he was just a device. And, like, people. I think people were distracted by his presence in the first place. And I'm kind of glad he's out of the picture. I didn't really care. I wasn't that, like, intrigued by him honestly anyways because i know there's so much other stuff we could do with this show he's still a cool character but it's like i mean come on guys there's <laughs> Balin and shin and ahsoka with anakin and like there's just a million other things that could happen so like i'm kind of glad we don't have to well, theorize you don't, on him anymore honestly like i loved the theorizing on him because it makes the show so fun and it makes mm. the experience of the show so much fun so i didn't really mind it it didn't kill me that he ended up being nothing like that's fine I don't care. You know, it's it's just fun to kind of delve a little bit deeper than surface level. And I think that that's a big part of the enjoyment of Star Wars for me personally. But yeah, I don't think it was a big deal about him. And if they added that on, that's another th- thread that they would have to address and then fix, like, yeah. tie it up with a pretty bow by the time the show ended. And yeah, you can't it overcomplicate things. it. Yep. Yeah, totally. <laughs> exactly. Um, all right, so let's jump into some general thoughts, I think, maybe first. Uh, mm-hmm. And yeah, and then we can do our, our scene-by-scene breakdown. But before we do that, you guys, make sure to click like, subscribe. If you're new and joining us from the stream last night, thank you. If you've subscribed, we appreciate it. Thank you for joining us here. Um, click the notification bell so you know when our episodes come out. We do these every week after every new episode. And don't forget to write on our uh, community page your thoughts and theories, and we'll read them out on the show. I don't know if we have many this week because we're doing this the day after the episode, but um, and we usually do it a little bit later. But mm-hmm. uh, yes, thank you for joining us if you're new, and if you are returning, we appreciate you as well. Um, all right, so a couple things from me, I think, just like overall thoughts. Let's jump in. Yeah, go for just it. Just a couple, like, and we can get more into depth on some of these thoughts, like <laughs> as we talk through it. Um, Rosario, still kind of dull for me. I think this episode, she shined a little bit more in the second half. I think mm-hmm. she, she got a little, a little bit better. I think it's a dialogue thing. I think her dialogue's just a little weird. It doesn't really feel very Ahsoka-y, if that makes sense. She lacks, like, a depth for the character, if, if that makes sense. Like, mm-hmm. I, especially in the first, uh, the first couple episodes, but then the first se- couple scenes, um, of this episode too, like just some weird things. Like it was just kind of over the top, like the way she's looking at Sabine and some of the, and she, she's, it's, this has been the case for the whole show so far, but like yeah. it's highlighted in the beginning part of this episode. She's like sitting there like so dramatic, just her, her glances over. She's being like so moody and it just doesn't feel like that character to me. It kind of takes me out of it. I don't know if you agree with that, but that's just something I've noticed. But I think in the second part of the ep- the second half of the episode, you start seeing it a little bit more. And I think it starts with when her and Sabine just start sprinting off <laughs> into the forest. Yeah. <laughs> um, there, there's a little bit more there when she's fighting Balin. Um, some of the looks she gives at the very end of the episode, I think, you know, it's, it's picking up for her. So mm-hmm. I'm anxious to see what they do with her in the second part of this, this show. I'm, I'm hoping that the dialogue's a bit more, uh, snappy for her, for her character because I just feel like yeah it doesn't feel very natural right now it kind of feels like people are just like some of the and it's not just an Ahsoka thing either I think it's like some of the characters just feel like they're talking at each other and saying a line mm-hmm. rather than rather than expressing how they actually feel as that character if that makes sense yeah that's a really good way uh, of putting it yeah so uh, that was one thing number two Hu, uh, Hu Yang is awesome Hu Yang is awesome getting his name wrong every time i don't know how to pronounce it Hewing is awesome um his effects are so cool like i can't tell if it's cg or practical or whatever it's just it's really good like yeah it, the voice acting is amazing it feels very star warsy the writing's on point for him i think it's flawless for him weirdly <laughs> enough like as a droid side character um he's just really well written i think yeah um so he's still a huge highlight of the show for me same thing with balin i think the writing all around for him has been pretty spot on like he feels very genuine very well written mysterious uh you feel a little uh, empathetic (laughs) towards him too like Mm -hmm. you don't you don't hate him as a villain which is generally means they they did a good job writing him um i don't love morgan 
Uh, she's so smug in this episode, and I don't know why. She got her ass kicked by Ahsoka in, in Mando, and she's just like so arrogant. And I don't know why she's the leader of Balin. I don't get that. Like he's way cooler and more like level headed, I think. Mm-hmm. And like he has that line where she goes, "Is that fear I sense in your voice?" And he's like, "No, experience." You know, and that's a, mm-hmm. that's a badass line. That's such a good line. Um, but she's just, I don't know. I don't know why she's the boss of them. Like he's, I don't know. I don't who really put her that. in charge. Yeah. Who put, who died and put her in charge. Um, uh, music is still phenomenal. Much darker. This episode, there was one scene I didn't like with the music surprisingly. Um, Ooh, but which was that? It, it's still, it's still phenomenal. It's the scene when, when Hera's in the hangar with that guy. And this scene also felt very much like they were just talking at each other. Like, I oh, earlier. the, the, and, the shift in tone to we're at the rebellion now. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> and you're just like, oh, this is this. I don't know. It's very bizarre. <laughs> like, and, and also just the lines there just felt very like force she's like watch me i'm leaving also her bringing her kid with her on a dangerous mission is hysterical (laughs) what are you doing dude classic Um, day with mom yeah classic day with mom the sprinting in the forest scene i thought was hilarious (laughs) um also um just because, like, I don't... Did they, did they never said they knew where they were going. They just started, like, sprinting into the forest. I get they're in a hurry, but it's yeah. just, like, kind of <laughs> funny. Um, Jason's a loser. I don't know. Like, he <laughs> honestly did. Like, he doesn't add anything to the show, in my opinion. It's kind of a waste of space. He honestly time. could have just been a cameo. Yeah. And honestly, I, what I think... I, I, I know they have to explain him being there because, obviously, it's Tara's son, right? And it's mm-hmm. Kanan's son. But, like, just be him, have him be sent off to school or something. And, like, he <laughs> shows a quick cameo and he's he's gone. I just, I don't know. It's, it's just kind of an, a level of complexity I don't care about. And I'm not yeah. invested in that guy. If you haven't watched the other shows, it just does. It's not, like, mm-hmm. <laughs> not integral to the show to me. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, sound design is awesome. Cinematography, again, th- huge standouts in this show. A lot of these big, like, like, the forest sequence was really cool. The sweeping landscape shot of, like, the trees with that cool little ritual area. Mm-hmm. Um, the transition at the end into the world between worlds. Um, the Shin is cool. I don't know what it is, but she just works for me. Like, the, yeah. it doesn't seem like a forced character at all. That's another one. Her, um, the lightsaber fights are much better in this episode than they were uh, in previous episodes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. When I watched it the second, actually, I watched it three times because I stayed up till one in the morning so I could like rewatch my favorite scenes and be excited with Twitter because it was fun. Mm-hmm. Um, but I rewatched the fight scenes multiple times and they are really good. Mm-hmm. They did not yeah. feel choreographed to me at all. They felt a lot more natural. Yeah. Uh, I do kind of wish we still had some more of the prequel era type stuff. I know some people don't like that mm-hmm. style as much but i love it i still think this was good like this was really it felt more um natural i mm-hmm. guess it didn't yeah so i love that um you know i have some questions but i mean those are kind of my my obviously the ending of the episode is fantastic and i have some stuff i want to talk through but we can get through that in the the, mm-hmm. the shot by shot or scene by scene breakdown but those are my like general mm-hmm. thoughts i mean overall it's it's an excellent <laughs> episode um i just think like the main takeaway for me is like you've, there's a tone shift with this yeah particular episode and it makes me really excited for the next few yeah i think that's all incredibly well said i agree with you on a lot of points i'll i'll give my brief overall thoughts and then we can dive into the nitty-gritty of the episode but i think that this episode just made me go ah. you know like i felt like i could breathe a little bit after it because up until this point i've enjoyed what i've seen but i haven't loved it You know, I haven't Mm. been like, oh, my gosh, I'm so hyped up, all that kind of stuff. And I'm okay with that. But, you know, a lot of the like how you brought up a lot of the dialogue in certain scenes, especially with Ahsoka and Sabine, have felt very wooden and Mm. very stiff. And they do feel like they're talking at each other. I still am of the opinion that I don't think that they set up the groundwork for Rosario's Ahsoka very well. I think they just kind of tossed you into it and then expected you to have all the knowledge of Clone Wars and Rebels. And so if you do have all the knowledge of Clone Wars and Rebels, you're probably going to be a little bit more accepting and sympathetic to this Ahsoka as opposed to a newcomer who's coming in and watching it for the first time. I, I'm i still worried about the the character of Ahsoka, but I think... Like how you just said, the second half of the episode, her performance got a little bit more varied. Like, she had emotional reactions to things. Like, when she thought Sabine was dead, 
her effectively using her rage to toss Shin up against the rock and knock her unconscious. These moments where she loses herself and she falls over. Her reaction when she sees Anakin, like, that, there she is. Mm. Let's pull out more of that. Give me more of those performances. I just want to see a little bit more personality. And I understand, like, how we talked about before, this is not going to be a happy-go-lucky Ahsoka. It's just, I just want to see more of what Rosario can do with the character. Because right now she's extremely one-dimensional in how she's presenting the character. And I think a lot of that is because of the direction that she's been given. And some of the dialogue isn't fantastic. Uh, now, on top yeah. of that, the second half of the episode with Rosario, I was digging it. I was like, I'm really seeing Ahsoka in some yeah. of these scenes here. And I really like what I'm seeing. So I hope they continue to carry that to the end of the show and we really start to get a shift with Ahsoka's character because I do think they're trying to take her on an arc. And if that's the case, by the time we get to the end of the series, we should see a much different person that w- than we did at the beginning, a.k.a. her Gandalf phase. So I'm really hoping that that's carried through to the end. Um, Sabine's improving. I've I've been a little bit worried about that character just because, like, I feel like she's a bit over the top in some scenes where she's like, why is this happening? Like, I don't know. Some of the line delivery has been weird, but I thought that she was also a big improvement this episode. Yeah. Still not 100% there on Hera. She just feels like a caricature of Hera as opposed to Hera herself. And I think her interpretation of the animated character probably bugs me the most out of Ahsoka Sabine and Hera. Because hers does not feel natural to me. I really see Natasha and Rosario leaning more into their roles. I'm not really seeing that with Hera. I get glimpses of her, but I'm just... There's something off about that performance that I'm not loving. Um, Balin is exceptional. I love what Ray Stevenson is bringing to this character. It is so hard to watch knowing that this was his final performance. But he brings such a depth and a nuance to the character where you really feel for him and what he's going through and we don't know his true motivations yet but you're kind of rooting for him where you want him to succeed you want him to get to his goal and one thing i want to talk about in this episode is the fact that he genuinely sees ahsoka as the villain he doesn't think that she's a good person he really believes that what he's doing is right which is what makes an antagonist so great is the fact that they believe that what they're doing is the correct thing to do and i think balin is such an exceptional example of that type of character no complaints on him. I think he's flawless, and I am so obsessed with that character, and I cannot wait to see where they take him. Other highlights, Hugh Wang, I completely agree with you. David Tennant, what he brings to that character is amazing. That blend of animatronics and animation is perfect. No complaints there. Amazing. The world feels very lived in, which is something I cannot say for all of the other Star Wars shows, so I really appreciate that aspect. Um... Shin Batty is wonderful. I love her. Perfectly understated. Not too much, but you still want to learn about her. I hope she stays a bad guy. Um, What else? What else? What else? Let me see. There was a lot of good story points. I think we're starting to get some good answers that we can delve into. I really enjoyed the lightsaber battles. And of course, the king, Hayden Christensen. How do you not love that guy? I mean, he just shows up and the swell of emotions. Oh my gosh, that just comes along with like seeing his face. I I hope he watches people's reactions. I hope he sees all this love and admiration and happiness. I'm sure he does, yeah. Um, He just deserves all the good stuff in the world. But I think that for me, this episode really made me go, okay, because I really felt like this was going to be the make or break. It's going to be, we're going to be stuck or we're going to start going places. And I really feel strongly that this is setting us tonally on a completely different shift for the series as a whole. And that makes me really excited for next week. So I guess those are my general overall thoughts. But let's let's talk some details because I'm dying to get into it. (laughs) Yes, let's do it. So let's jump into our scene by scene. Also agree with all your thoughts. And we can get into Mm -hmm. the nuance of those as we chat through here. All right. So this is episode four. Fallen Jedi is the title. Very cool title. Uh, This was written by Dave Filoni and directed by Peter Ramsey, which I do think might be the difference maker here. Uh, I agree. Peter Ramsey did an excellent job directing this episode. I think Um, it just flowed very nicely and there was a lot of good direction choices that he made that I think really resonated with people across the board. So shout out to him. Yeah, Peter Ramsey crushed 
he did. Um, let him cook, dude. Let him let cook. him let him cook. He cooks just so like, hard. Just like just like just like Balin, dude. Let him cook. Let the guy let cook. Him cook. What is he doing? I don't know what's going on. Uh, um, before you dive in, just keep in mind who you think Fallen Jedi is referring to here, because it has. A well, it definitely meaning. refers to Ahsoka falling down. <laughs> okay, but in a <laughs> metaphorical sense, in a metaphorical sense, who is it referring to? Because it could have multiple it's, meanings. It's multiple meanings. We know it is because that's how Filoni's mind works. It's definitely Balin because we know he was in the Order. He knew Anakin Skywalker. He talks about it. Uh, we know it's Ahsoka falling, quite literally. And Anakin shows up at the end, um, which I have thought thoughts on this. But I don't want to get into them now because that will be a whole tangent that <laughs> we can I'm looking forward to it. Okay. Um, all right. So following up on the events of Episode 3, we open up on Cetos, uh, where Ahsoka and Sabine's ship is damaged after the fight with Shin and Merak, Marak, whatever, RIP. Uh, we see Hewing working on the repairs. Sabine is calling for Hera, uh, but it doesn't work. So Sabine steps outside to find Ahsoka sulking. She's just kind of staring <laughs> into the woods, pondering, I guess. <laughs> And um, she says something interesting, which is if the enemy has the map to find Thrawn and Ezra, and if Ahsoka and Sabine can't recover that, then no one should find those, uh, those them. And Sabine doesn't really agree with them. And she's like, if, you know, they're, they're talking about if Ezra's life is really worth the safety of the galaxy. Um, and then they, set, they decide they want to set out on the enemy ground base as uh, the repairs continue here um as they as Hewing's making the repairs we see some droid hands lingering in the distance and then we go to another scene where shin tells balin and morgan that they found ahsoka balin tells them and their droids to move in and hunt them down um and morgan gives a cool or i'm sorry morgan gives a line here to balin asks if she senses fear in his voice and he just says uh no experience sick line and then we get the title card here a couple things in these scenes real quick Ahsoka being weird and pondery was that was the whole thing happening. <laughs> I don't think the dialogue was w written well here, where where it was like the no one should have this map if we can't get it, no one should have it. I just feel like they could have communicated that point a little bit more, mm -hmm. like debated it more. I guess <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, fought made, over it, and also made it a bigger point. Like, hey, this is a grave decision we're making. You know, like should anyone even have this? You know, I don't know. I just feel like that was. That's kind, of, that's kind of a big thing. Like That's kind of the whole driving force of this episode because yeah, I, they obviously go back and forth with the Treasure Planet map. So, like, <laughs> I don't know. That was, I thought that was just... It, they just didn't really drive that point home. Well, life. also, I don't know how much Sabine's going to fight that because in that whole scene, Ahsoka makes a point like, hey, I need to know I can count on you because you've stolen this map before and run off, and I need to know that you're not going to do this again. I think they could have expressed that in a better yes. way, and they yes. could have been like... She could have said something closer along the lines of, hey, I'm having a hard time believing that you're going to go through with this because of what happened over here. And it could have just maybe added a little bit more challenge between those two characters. And yeah. it it would have helped. I don't think it's like a huge qualm, but at the same time, I feel like these scenes could use like minor tweaks to just make them that much better. Yeah, I'm not saying it cr crushes the episode. I'm just saying this is kind no, of, this, of a symptom of the season thus far in terms of yeah. the dialogue. But I agree with you. It's like, yes, she's like, can I trust you? It's like, well, I don't know, punch that up a little bit more. Make it yeah. something more like natural yeah. uh, and conversational. They have their, talking at each other. Their dialogue is very much like one lines. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just line. Yeah. Line. It's not conversational. Line. Yeah. Line, yeah. I, th I think that's um, what gets me. Although, about it. Good, I know they're capable of good writing because they did it at the end of this scene with Balin and Morgan. He's like, Balin has the best lines to do. Yeah. Um, I sense. Um, I don't see many people talking. I feel like I'm the only one who's brought this up. But like the medieval influence in this show. With oh yeah, Merrick. Morgan is similar to like Morgana, right? From like King Arthur. Like mm -hmm. the way Balin's dressed is very medieval. He has the big shoulder plates and stuff. It's not your typical Jedi or Sith garb, mm -hmm. you know? It's just something I've noticed. It's a cool choice. It's a cool stylistic choice. But uh, he has the Balin's line there, I think, was, was great. Like that was conversational. Mm -hmm. I, I felt it felt more natural. Um,. All right, so then we see Huang continuing repairs. We see Sabine 
putting on her Mandalorian armor and panics searching for something in her bag. And Ahsoka's like, hey, dude, relax. And like shows her this weird little Lego piece or whatever that thing was. I mean the bullet to her gun or whatever it is? Oh, is that what that was? Oh, I yeah, think. she was checking her guns. Yeah, I think you're probably right. Um, Sabine's like, I'm fine, no big deal. And then Ahsoka's like, look, sometimes we have to do what's right regardless of personal feelings. Again, I didn't feel like this was super conversational. Mm-hmm. Like talk to her like she's a person. You don't need to speak in these like platitude type like cryptic sayings. like yeah. wise person ways. Very yeah like, yeah. yeah. She's it's... just very like hmm. Sometimes <laughs> we have to do what's right even if we don't like it. I'm like just say say it like an she, old person. She, I just her dialogue does feel very much like dialogue written on a page. Yeah, and I, I get I understand what they're trying to do here. I get what they're trying to do but I don't think they're communicating in a way where you and I are talking to each other right now. Like normal people don't talk like that. <laughs> no. And don't. so when and, you but, watch but it here's, from the outside, you're point. like, hmm. A more important point. Ahsoka doesn't really talk like that. I, in my opinion, I don't know. I'd like, she doesn't, that doesn't really seem like something she would say. There's just this like weird, I'm better than you attitude she has towards Sabine for whatever reason. <laughs> and I don't know. I don't know if they're trying to play it off as she's super guarded around Sabine. Yeah. Or if it's just a dialogue thing. I think it's a mix of both. Honestly, I think they're trying to play the she is trying to push down her emotions regarding Sabine because as you see later in the episode, she has a reaction when she thinks Sabine's dead. Mm-hmm. And I like that a lot. Yes, so I but think I wasn't getting that. I, I like up to this point you're like, does she even care about her? <laughs> right, right. And I agree with that. I don't think that they've showcased that relationship how much Ahsoka really cares. Mm. But they did towards the end of the episode. Mm. I think like it, it got a lot better as, it, yeah. as the episode moved on, funny enough. Mm. Um, I just, look, these are stupid nitpicky things that I talk about. I, it didn't ruin the episode for me by any stretch of the imagination. I just think it's uh, it illustrates some of the dialogue issues in earlier episodes. I, I agree with you completely. Um, so as we see Hewing making progress, uh, fixing the ship, he's attacked by the assassin droids and we find out that, uh, Hewing can fight, which is awesome. He's in his little hand to hand combat bra, which this was a cool little part of the episode. I thought like an interesting little fight between Hewing and, uh, the, the droid. And then we see, um, he is muted by the guy. The guy puts his hand over his mouth and then he gets one of his little arm things out and turns off the power to kind of mm-hmm. alert Sabine and Ahsoka. This this is when, to me, the episode's like, oh, yeah. Because uh, Ahsoka has a, a, it's a pretty cool line here, I thought. She's like, he wouldn't do that on purpose or whatever. And she like turns on her lightsabers as she walks outside. Dude, pretty, she, her Henry cool. Cavill moment, he wouldn't do yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> So yeah. it's it is her Henry Cavill loading the arms moment. I love yeah. I love that. It probably came off cheesy to some people, but I loved that because it was it felt natural to me. It felt seamless. He wouldn't. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. It was awesome. And it then they cool. fight them all outside, make quick work of them. They quickly take them all out. Uh Huang makes some weird, cute comment about asking them to stick together. <laughs> and then they're like don't worry, we will together. And then we get this look from Ahsoka, which to me is I'm like, okay, that there seems... There she is. There she is. Yes. Like, she gives a little smile, and I'm like, okay, yes, that feels like... like yeah. She's not that cold. I just, I've gotten a very cold vibe from her mm-hmm. thus far. Like, hmm, I'm so wise. And I don't know if like, they've hey, necessarily like, made her likable. You know, I don't, I yeah. don't think the average person's going to find Ahsoka likable generally in this show. Mm. And I think I think there are flashes of her like in this episode that smile there she is you see her like keep that whatever that was let's get yeah. more of that because yeah. the natural core of Ahsoka's character is she's extremely kind you know how Obi-Wan he goes through all this crap in his life and then he willingly chooses to stay on Tatooine to watch over the son of his best friend when Luke meets Obi-Wan Obi-Wan's seen shit he's been through a lot but the yeah. core of his character is still incredibly kind. And he's like nice to Luke. Like he's honest. He's like, hey, um, your aunt and uncle are dead, but you come with me and we're going to start this this new life. We're going to start you on this journey. Like he cares very much about Luke's well-being. And you see that throughout the entire original trilogy. So then when Luke and Obi-Wan sit down, Luke's like, why the heck didn't you tell me about my dad? And Obi-Wan's like, I don't want to lose you. 
And (laughs) like that is a good example of a character who at their core has been beaten down a lot by life, but is still very kind. And I think the core of Ahsoka's character has always been very kind. I don't think there's anything wrong with making her a little bit cynical, but I just am having a hard time making this straight connection to her from the previous series that we've seen her in. Yeah. Especially when coming to Sabine, I don't really think they have a lot of chemistry. I don't, I definitely don't think they do. And I, it feels like it's on purpose though. Yeah. Um, which is, that's what's odd about it to me. But, um, I think there was a tone shift though with this episode. Um, with their relationship luckily, too. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. So where are we? Okay. We go back to Hera. Okay. Well, they, they start sprinting into the forest, which I think is hysterical. <laughs> which they by the way, running. like they're like, we got to go find this place. And just like in a <laughs> random direction, which is, <laughs> is funny. Random side note really quick. I love that Huang cares. I love that they've given so much personality and like warmth to this droid and it's mm-hmm. a droid, but yeah. you can tell that he really cares about both of these women. And he's like, Hey, you guys work together well when you actually try and be careful and it's just i i just think that it's like a nice little extra added detail cute uh, it is right. it's you're very right. wholesome he's, he's well written um we go back we see Hera chopper and her son jason spelled with a c and an e i'm not gonna <laughs> not bring that up every time like i have to bring that up every time because it's so stupid um Hera is like the guy comes up he's like well you can't leave without authorization she's like Watch me, and I'm gonna bring my young son with me on a dangerous, <laughs> on a dangerous mission. Then we see they fire up the ship on the ghost, the live action version of the Very ghost. Very cool to see. Yeah, she is joined by Carson Teva, uh, crossing over from Mandalorian land. And, uh, <laughs> is he in everything? Is he just like the everyman? <laughs> like, yeah. like when people want to go do something rogue, he's the person supporting them. <laughs> like, yeah, and a couple other rando pilots too, who all die. Who, yeah, we don't know. That's the Expendables. <laughs> yeah, we see the Expendable pilots. Um, then we go back to Morgan Balin debating the calculations of the hyperspace jump. She tells him to have faith, and Balin's talking about how he lost faith years ago. Mm, interesting line. Those little things. It's yeah. Like, ooh, more layers to the cake here. To He's the onion so understated. Of, I love him. Of Ray Stevenson's great uh, character thus far. Um, she uses her night sister magic to open up the coordinates as they plot their route to Thrawn. They know they have to be precise with this, uh, these calculations or it could go terribly wrong. Then we see Ahsoka and Sabine sprinting to the woods. They're stopped by Merrick and Shin. They are halted here and, uh, going see somewhere. Shin give, yeah, she gives her a little line going somewhere. It weirdly works though. I think yeah, she's cool. I think so. She's a cool, I don't know. She's great. I like her. There is nothing like unnatural about that character to me. I, she just works. Yeah. Yeah. I feel the same way. Also, she's a baddie. Um, she's a baddie dude. And, uh, we see Sabine go versus Shin and Ahsoka versus Merrick for round two. Sabine just um, shot at her. This is, yes, she did. The race against time here. Um, qu- quick question here. So we talked about this on the stream a little bit, but um, the orange lightsaber versus red. It's a clear difference we see here now. Like there's definitely not a color choice of like that's how we're interpreting red. Mm-hmm. What do we? Oh, what do we think about that? A and also B. I think for whatever reason they look way better in this show than they did in Obi Wan and yep. Mando. Yep, I think I don't know what it is. I don't know why. I can't tell you. I'm not a VFX guy, but they look better. They look, I don't, and I couldn't define it when I said I didn't like them before. But I look at them, in, uh, them here, and I'm like, they just look more natural and better. I think in Obi Wan they were using actual lightsabers that lit up, and I think in this show the lightsaber effect is added in post, and I think it's a touch. But it up. does still reflect off their face. You I can know, see. I, but I, but I just I don't think, think it's they're... as intense. I think they turned down the brightness on them, maybe. There's that there's that possibility, but also CGI has changed a lot since Revenge of the Sith and the original prequel trilogy. Um, and even more so from when we first saw lightsabers in 1977. So I'm I'm kind of convinced that there's a good mixture of what they're actually holding and then what they actually do in post. And I think mm-hmm. I think because Dave Filoni respects George Lucas so much, he tries to mimic the elements that George brought to the original and prequel trilogy so i think on that front i definitely agree with you i think the effects are a lot better they're not overdone 
I mean, even the lightsabers in the sequel trilogy looked better than in the Kenobi show. Like they just lit up the room too much. It was like a, like they a looked freaking... like cosplay lightsabers. Yeah, like they so did. Bright. They did look like they look. You know what it looked like? You know that lightsaber I have uh, in my closet that I bought from like Disney Parks. Mm-hmm. It looks like that in the Kenobi show. Yeah, it doesn't look like how the lightsabers in Star Wars look, and I think it's because they've taken them down. They've just understated them to look more like the prequel yeah. trilogy. Which, by the way, kudos to the VFX team. Like, they yeah. look really good. Yeah, they do. I agree. But then what does the colors mean? What do we think on that? Does it mean they're not fully committed? Or they didn't it's bleed something, the crystals all the way? It's not Sith. You know, I, I, I think it's just a way of saying, hey, we we uh, embrace the dark side more than the light, but they're not completely committed to the Sith. It's like so, they're making it their own. It's like using the dark side, but making it our own you know, not fully leaning into the Sith tendencies. It's like using a maybe a balance of both like the light and the dark with a geared tendency toward the dark. Yeah. I don't even know what Dave Filoni said on it, man. I don't know if he said anything. I think everyone, the, the jury's out on it, but it is cool. It's a cool. I'm going to look up. What do orange light mean? Um, what do you- okay. Here. Um, I don't think people know. I think it's supposed to be kind of a mystery. It, and I think it, it might be just the most obvious answer, which is they're just not fully committed. Um, I mean, it, the answer that came up is exactly what I just said. These characters are not exactly Jedi, but they aren't entirely Sith as well as the general consens- consensus. Yeah. is They have a propensity toward the dark, but they're not fully committed like Sith. Yeah, I mean, Balin, this is what's interesting about him, is he is more of a like Jedi who just doesn't agree with them. Like, And we see this later on in the duel, and we can talk about this later, but like the way he's able to use like Jedi tactics, like he's able to mm. best... Ahsoka, but then also use reasoning to convince Sabine. It's not really a Sith thing to do. It's more nope. of a Jedi thing to do, you know? Mm-hmm. All right, so we see Ahsoka fighting them uh, as Mo- Morgan and Balin are loading the coordinates into the Eye of Scion. Um, <laughs> Ahsoka uh, is fighting Merrick here, and he has this cool little spinny uh, helicopter lightsaber, and... Um, she has this cool. She has these cool new stances that she's using with only one lightsaber this episode, which I thought was kind of interesting. And as he's about to strike her, she just goes, <laughs> kills him, makes quick, easy work of him, no problem. This is a um, very Obi Wan Kenobi kills Darth Maul and Rebels moment. Yes, very killing much. them with one strike. Very much so. And then he turns into the smoke monster from Lost and flies away. <laughs> and we find out that M- Maroc was nobody. Um, which we talked about at the beginning. I'm fine with that. I'm I, cool with it. He was a kind of a cool dude, but um, seems like he was conjured with <laughs> what? Nice magic sister or magic. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Look, I wish they. You know what? I wish they would have done. I wish they would have because sh- uh, the consensus that I came to on that was Maroc was an already deceased Inquisitor that Morgan Elsbeth resurrected and used Night Sister magic to make him do her bidding because we saw that yeah. that's what um that's what happened in the clone wars with like the deceased night sisters they used uh night sister magic to bring the dead back to life to fight actually it's really you know what that is extremely lord of the ringsy that is aragorn's army of the undead i just realized that that's what so is? interesting the uh in lord of the rings where like he gets all the the you think that's similar to the night sister thing uh well in it just reminds me of it. I don't know if it's like necessarily. Mm. It's just like kind of a a reminder. But I think that mm. I think that Maroc was just a resurrected corpse of an Inquisitor. But it would have been nice if they did something gritty and like shown showed like the skeletal face of the Inquisitor. Yeah. That would have been cool. Yeah, that would have been cool. But I like um, I like that battle, and I liked how Sabine uh, is traditionally fighting with her Mando gear. Because that's just, like, that's her character. That's the core of her character. And she doesn't really bring out the lightsaber until she has to. Yes, good point. Um, Which leads us to the next part, which is she kills him. And then she's like, I'm going to go get the map and just leave Sabine fighting Shin. Which (laughs) Maybe not the best choice. (laughs) (laughs) Not the best choice. But Sabine holds her own, as we see later. We see Morgan leaving Balin to protect the map to prepare for her departure as Ahsoka's getting there. Balin has the coolest stance here with his vast shoulders. You could film a movie, dude, on Balin's shoulders. Like, they're so big. Uh, he's like, he just commands the screen. He's so cool. His his presence, his form, the way he fights in lightsaber combat, dude, everything about the character just demands your attention. Yeah. 
He looks very medieval here again. I will say it again. He does look very uh, medieval-esque here. He talks about to Ahsoka about how Anakin spoke very highly about her, but then talks to her about like, oh, must must sting now because few live few live to see what he became. Mm-hmm. Must suck for you. Like <laughs> you got to see all that. Trying Sucks to get to, to her you. pisses her off definitely. Um, she says, "I'm not here to discuss my past." Then they have some really good dialogue where she's like, he's like, I'm here to secure the future. And then he he goes into detail and he says, um, or she says something about bringing Thrawn back. And he says, it's an unfortunate evil, but it speaks to a greater truth. Mm -hmm. One must destroy in order to create. I love this line. I love this line so much because it immediately tells you that Balin really thinks what he's doing is necessary. And he's like, mm, you know, um, your master was evil and you're just kind of a product of that evil. And I think you need to to get out of the way. It's unfortunate. I would really yeah. prefer not to do this. But he also kind of gives a funny line where he's like, I don't want war. He's like, I'm just releasing Thrawn. Who wants war? So <laughs> <laughs> what does he want? That's that's what's we interesting. Don't know, but here. I think it is interesting to, to be like, what is this guy? Let him cook again. Let him cook. <laughs> Let him cook. Yeah. What's he want? What's going on here? What do you um, think is going on with him? Because when he talks to Shin, and remi- she's you know like, what he reminds me of? He reminds me of Thanos, where it's like, yeah, you know, a like, little bit. It's kind of a Thanos y type of vibe. Um, well, because you know how he talks to Shin, and she's like, Master, what awaits us when we find Thrawn? And he goes, Power, such mm. as you've never dreamed. And then he's like, Hey, sh- releasing Thrawn's just a product of what we're trying to get here. Um, that's not really my problem. You yeah. know, that's kind of what it's coming off as. But the fact that we don't even know what he wants. I don't know, dude. I'm finding Balin more intimidating than the 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 resurgence of Thrawn. Like yeah. right now, I, I don't really feel like too worried about Thrawn. And now I'm like, what the hell's Balin going to do? Yeah. Like he's willing to let things die in order to get what he wants. But what does he want? Yeah. He's talking about how he just wants to create a new way, even if it's the, he's going to get it out of the the ashes of the Thrawn's war. He he has an alternate agenda. I don't think we're supposed to know, but it is interesting to what like a dark Jedi order is. could be. I don't know. I mean, he's he's clearly interested in that. He has a Padawan, right? Yeah. Um, so interesting. They both draw their lightsabers here. I think uh, Ahsoka's line of like, "I am not here to discuss my past." I didn't love the delivery of that, to be honest. I just didn't feel very Ahsoka-y. But cool, it, you, it did convey the a, like an emotion of like she's pissed. Like stop yeah, talking to me about stop that. Stop talking to me about that. It's still um, it's still a sensitive topic for her, where she still really blames herself for leaving because mm-hmm. she thinks she could have changed what happened. Yeah, and I think her Gandalf moment is going to come in the form of you need to accept that what happened happened, and you could not yep. have stopped it. And speaking of Gandalf's moments, she now removes her gray yep. hood here. Um, we also talked about this last night on the stream, but that was interesting. So I think we're on to something with the whole Gandalf, the gray to Gandalf, the white thing. Which they both draw their lightsabers, start fighting. Great performances here as they're fighting. Ahsoka's trying to get the map. Um, his fighting style is very unique. Hers has changed a bit as well. She has this cool samurai type of like stance. He has his like Qui-Gon stance mm-hmm. which i thought was interesting the way his movements are it's just a cool style it's very unique and different and you can tell they put a lot of thought into it and it just works for his character honestly I, you know what this um, equated he's very fierce yeah. as well like the in that first when they first start hitting each other and he's like mm-hmm. you know um just those little things i thought were cool yeah i like how how his uh his moves are very like slow but they're heavy hitting and she's a little bit more nimble. I really liked how they contrasted like both their fighting styles. You could tell that a lot of thought was put into his fighting style versus hers. I had another thought, and I don't know what I was going to say here. It's okay. We can keep going if you remember it. You can uh, yeah, I it up. I'm sure we'll get to it. It's, she's fighting. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Meanwhile, we, as we see this, Shin escapes Sabine. She flees into the woods, does her cool little oh, Batman smoke screen. I remembered what I was going to say. Go ahead. The way they play out the choreography, especially between Balin and Ahsoka, it feels very honorable, like like respectful. I don't know how to put this. Maybe it's a like um, a Kurosawa thing. I haven't seen enough Kurosawa films to speak to this, but it's like really respecting your opponent. 
Hmm. You know, the stances that they take, it's like almost like a way of honoring each other in combat. It's I don't know. Like the way it played was just a little bit more like knightly, you know, very medieval, very knightly, very I, I don't know what other word to describe it as is honorable. Just the way yeah. it looked, the poses they were taking, kind of like waiting to see who's going to hit first. They take a couple blows at each other and then they step back. It was almost like they were sparring in the Jedi Temple. You know, it was like a, like a training bit. It was just like two Jedi masters at work. Very interesting. It was I don't know if that cool. makes sense. He also really seems to hate her for whatever reason. We don't really know. But he doesn't he want says, to kill her at the same time. He says your legacy is one of like death and destruction. And you're like, is it? <laughs> that was just an interesting line i don't know like he he's he's angry at her for whatever reason he's angry at her but he also has been shown that he he doesn't want to kill her no you know no. Yeah, well because in right. like he's... the earlier episodes he's like that's eh, a shame yeah you know i right that's a good point i don't want to kill her anyway um, let's keep going sh- yeah so sh- he he says you're you've brought death and destruction she tries to grab the treasure planet map burns her hand a la uh evil bad guy from raiders of the lost ark i think that's kind of like a little shout out to lucasfilm's other masterpiece but i already said this but shin escapes sabine uh because sabine shoots a little wrist rocket at her it does her little bitch like a force force bitch slap do you think she was sabine. using the force yeah, she definitely was. It was pretty obvious. They, I she goes. Oh. I don't know if she was using the force or if Shin just flinched. Like I really I couldn't tell. I think it was. It was the force for sure. One hundred percent. That was. Yeah, it was like it was. There's like, oh, like her hair moves and stuff. Baby force push. Um, yeah, it was like she's trying her best, but she sucks at it. And then Shin uses her little Batman <laughs> smoke screen, which again is kind of funny. Balin's pretty pissed when Shin gets there. And to protect the map, Ahsoka sees Shin, and she's also like, oh, she probably killed Sabine. And we actually mm-hmm. see some emotion from her here, and then Force slams her against the wall. That's kind of badass. Um, kind of violent that, and uncharacteristic of her. Yes, and that pisses Balin off, dude. He yeah. Is, oh, God. He was. They were both pretty mad where their apprentices were concerned. Yeah. Uh, he was not happy about that. And he's like, you, that was a mistake about the map or whatever. And then he rages towards her, pushing her back and back closer to the edge. Um, and then we actually see Sabine come from the distance. And Ahsoka's like, hey, destroy that. And <laughs> Sabine, understandably, is like, no, I don't feel like it. I want to go see my friend. And um, uh, she has the gun to it, which would that really destroy it? I don't know. Maybe, I mean, maybe not. I, I would only use the lightsaber personally, but hey, to each their yeah. own. Cheats their own. Um, <laughs> it also would have made sense. I don't know. That was, uh, yeah, hold, I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> so then uh, we see Balin go rage mode, uh, forcing Ahsoka over the edge. She's kind of weak from this, from holding that thing. I think and she's emotionally of off too. Like yeah. she was rage fighting. Like I think that she got to that point where she was so pissed off that Balin had brought up all this stuff about Anakin on top of the fact that th- that she thought Sabine died, on top of the fact that she burned her hand, on top of the fact that Balin is an aggressive monster beast at fighting and definitely had the hold over her. Um, she just lost herself emotionally a little bit. And rage has unbalanced her, as Darth Maul tells Obi-Wan. And she gets yacht off the edge. She becomes a fallen Jedi. Title of the <laughs> episode. She falls down, and we don't know what happens. It's kind of left open ended. Um, Sabine doesn't really seem to care that much. No, <laughs> she had a reaction. She yelled. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, she didn't seem as broken up about it, like emotionally, after that initial. Oh, part, you know what I mean? Yeah. Because then, like, he, he's uh, Balin starts walking towards her, and he's like, "You're not going to destroy it." And then he does this little like force mind reading thing, which is cool. And he like oh, kind of that. figures out what's going on. He's like, "You think Ezra is your only family because of?" Beca-. And then he and oh no, and then he re- reveals that her family died on Mandalore, which on is night news. Of a billion thousand billion million thousand tears, which I guess is news. We didn't know that, but that's why she's been hanging out on this Lothal planet, I guess, right? Yeah, which is uh, I did not expect this, but wherever Sabine's con- concerned. I never. I always forget that she has like a real family that's not the ghost family. I can't remember her dad's name. It's like Ald- Aldrich or something. 
Einrich, I don't remember her father's name, something like that, and then Ursa, and then her brother Tristan. So that's kind of tragic that all of them were killed. And then we kind of get some interesting insight, as you'll explain in this next scene here, that um, the reason that Ahsoka and Sabine had a falling out, it sounds like because Sabine wanted to go help her family, and Ahsoka's like, no. Mm. And as a result, Sabine's family was killed. That's what that's the impression that I got from this episode when we got that information and the fact that he's like, hey, I know about you have feelings for this this guy and you think that he's literally all you have left. And so you can't bear the thought to lose him. And so that's why she's struggling with Ahsoka so much, because Ahsoka, my theory is that Ahsoka was like, no, you can't go help your family like you have to let go of your attachments or whatnot. Um, Sabine listened to her. Her family died. And as a result, she's having a hard time uh, listening to Ahsoka now and letting go of Ezra because she doesn't want the same thing to happen. At least that's my theory. Got it. Interesting. So a lot of layers there mm-hmm. is what I'm getting from this part. Well, I mean, there's a lot. This whole The whole next couple minutes are like kind of action-packed. Um, he wants her to help. He wants to help her find Ezra. So he's trying to convince her, come on, let's just help me. Well, you can hang out with your friend again. Just give me the map. She hesitates a lot, but then still gives it to him. Good uh, move, by the way. Good move. <laughs> well, yeah, storytelling wise, for sure. Good move. And then also, she starts she having a tough time breathing as Shin is Darth Vader choking her, which understandable. I would uh-huh. do the same thing if I was her. I'd be pissed. And then Balin stops her and he's like, I got to keep my word. Unlike Ahsoka in the past. Um, uh, they load up the last of the map, the Morgan, uh, and then we see, uh, Hera calling into Hu Yang saying that they arrived and they're moving in to stop the eye of Scion. But on the surface, we see Balin destroying the map with his lightsaber as he and Shin take Sabine with them. She's in handcuffs too, which I think is interesting. Um, I'm still kind of confused as to what her role is going to be, but we will figure it out next week or the week after. They fly back to this big giant ship as the team move through. Morgan's like, whatever though, guys, we're we're peacing out. We're getting on the ship and we're flying. We're, we'll just we're kill Leroy them. Jenkinsing into the <laughs> Leroy Jenkinsing <laughs> into this fleet. She fires it up and jumps into hyperspace and totally yeets these X wings right into each other. We lose the NPC uh, X wing <laughs> fighter NPCs. pilots. Um, Carson Teva or Teva, I don't know how you say that. He seems to be fine, which is good. And then they, then they show us the scene with like Hera and Jason spelled with a C and an E, uh, <laughs> sitting in space. And he's like, "I've got a bad feeling," which I know what they're trying to do. They're trying to communicate that he's like force sensitive or something yeah. that he feels some kind of ripple in the force because his dad is Kanan and his mom is yeah. Twi'lek, and he doesn't look anything like her for some reason, which I still don't <laughs> understand. But like, the line was just like, I've, I don't know. I, <laughs> it's just a couple lines are are they don't, don't feel like supernatural I, unless he's going to play a huge part in the show and w- even that I wouldn't love I'm just like first of all Hera's a terrible mom like <laughs> you, almost, you almost killed both of you guys <laughs> look I mean she lost she lost her lover and she's like well if I'm going to die my kid may as well die with me <laughs> yeah. what are you thinking he's got to be what 10 11 he... 12 Nine or ten, maybe ten. I would say ten. Oh well, not a smart parental move here. Um, no, no. And then not at all. Uh, that is the last line that we have. They are kind of like floating through space. The the eye of sign got away. The the map is destroyed. No one's going to be following them um, that we know of. So it's kind of like on a dark note we end on here, which I really like. And then we see the cool transition that they, they did a really nice job on of like the beach. Um, mm-hmm. And then it kind of fades in and we see Ahsoka's arm and she is nowhere else but the world between. Actually, let me do something here. She is nowhere else other than the world between worlds. <laughs> the world between. Oop. World. Okay. So before we and then jump it into just this it part. just pans over Ahsoka Tano, <laughs> former Jedi. Rod you could Sterling. do a Twilight Zone episode with Rod Sterling standing off to the side. 
But what yeah. she doesn't realize is that she is in, in the world between the Twilight Zone. <laughs> okay, she is in the Twilight Zone. Before we jump into this scene, you got to tell me what is the world between worlds? If, if if someone's watching this right now and they don't know what this is, your average person, they see she's in this weird, sparkly space land. What is it? Because it's a relatively new concept. It is a space in which e- everything that is happening in the Star Wars universe is going on at the same time in this in this world between worlds. And there are portals to ooh, these specific moments in time. So everything is happening in, in the world between worlds. Everything is happening at the exact same moment. And you can hear echoes of these moments. When Ezra first accesses the world between worlds in Star Wars Rebels, you can hear scenes from Rogue One, you can hear scenes from The Force Awakens, you can hear it from the original trilogy, you can hear Anakin Skywalker, you can hear Yoda. All of these moments are happening at the same time in the world between worlds. There are portals in the world between worlds to these moments in Star Wars. You, if if you are in the world between worlds, you can pull people out of specific moments and you can change the course of history. And Got that it. goes for literally any moment that's going on. And that's how Ezra saved Ahsoka from dying at the hands of Darth Vader in Star Wars Rebels. And if you haven't seen Star Wars Rebels, you should definitely go watch it. Um, a lot of lore expansion in that show, which is super fun. But Palpatine tried to get a control of it in the Star Wars Rebels animated series, and he failed because Ezra opened and closed the portal using the hand symbols of the Mortis gods. So Mortis is also connected to this too. So there's there's a lot that we could theorize here because as we know, as we saw in the Clone Wars, Ahsoka is connected to the daughter. So that really brings up a lot of opportunities for what we're going to see potentially next week. But that in sum, I hope that gives like a good brief idea of what the world between worlds is. I think I, did nobody, nobody quote me on this, but I think when Dave Filoni was writing this, he took inspiration from... God, is the C.S. Lewis The Magician's Apprentice? Do you remember we had those books when we were kids? Magician's Nephew? The yeah, Magician's uh, Nephew, I think. Chronicles of Narnia, yeah. Or Narnia, or... Yeah, it's Magician's Nephew, or Chronicles of Narnia. Who wrote that? Was that C.S. Lewis? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chronicles of Narnia okay. C.S. Lewis, yeah. I think it's the, the, magician's, the Magician's Nephew. I don't really remember that book. Car- our sister Carolyn, she read that to me when I was... 12 or 13 years old but if i'm remembering this correctly dave filoni took inspiration from that book when he was writing the world between worlds um hang on world between worlds c.s lewis chronicles of narnia because he says like uh, okay in the chronicles of narnia i think this is this is one of the books the wood between the worlds hmm that's a Chronicles of Narnia thing. Got it. Oh, I found it. Um, it's the Enchanted Wood, I think. In the hold on, I'm looking at this. Okay, this is a quote from Dave Filoni regarding because um, I watched I watched this video. I believe this is correct. And if I can find the link, guys, I will provide it in the description below. But basically, Dave Filoni was doing a panel and he was talking about the introduction of the world between worlds. And he said, Filoni said that through C.S. Lewis's The Magician's Nephew's Wood Between the Worlds, so he took, so Dave Filoni took inspiration from C.S. Lewis's book, The Magician's Nephew, Wood Between the Worlds. Um, He said that that story really made an impression on him as a child. Um, He recalled it was very powerful, and that's why when Ezra's in the world between worlds, he has to watch himself and be careful. Dave Filoni explained, You have to be careful when you're moving through these big, powerful dimensions and what you're wishing for. Everything that Ezra is talking about in the world between worlds and what he's wishing for, like such as he wished that, um, you know, Kanan wasn't dead or he wished that his parents weren't dead and he could see them again. When Ezra makes certain statements between the world between worlds, there's a thunderclap and that thunderclap is representative of some something else listening. There's multiple things going on in here, and everything becomes a choice between how you want to use power and control and influence others. Um, when Ezra's, how do you get there? Hmm? How do you get there? 
There, uh, okay, I haven't seen Rebels in a really long time, but from what I remember, Ezra and uh, the Ghost Crew are on Lethal, and they find out that the Empire is messing with uh, an old Jedi temple, like, on the Lothal plains that he and Kanan had previously been to. So they go there, and they find out that there's, like, this portal that the Empire is trying to access, and they have, like, this old uh, crotchety guy, like, looking into it, because he has this fascination with, like, the Mortis gods, and... Ezra figures out the patterns thanks to Sabine's help, and they figure out that using the hand symbols of the Mortis gods, they can open the portal to the world between worlds. When they're in there, Ezra pulls Ahsoka out of the moment before she's meant to die with Vader, and then she and Ezra come upon a portal where they see the moments where Kanan's about to die, and Ahsoka's like, you can't save him, because if you save him, the rest of you die in this moment, and we you won't exist here. Mm. So it's it's really complicated. It's it's like this dimension where you can control all of these moments, but there's a lot that happens in there. Like, like how I just explained, Dave Filoni explained that if Ezra wishes for something in there, you hear a thunderclap, and that's indicative of something listening to him. So you have mm. to be careful with that kind of power. Got it. Now, with that in mind, there's a lot to unpack here because, again, the Mortis gods, um, are they going to come into play again? I don't know, but... That's a good explanation, and I yeah, think I don't know if that helped. <laughs> no, it does help, and I think if your average person doesn't know, you can listen to this and know now. Um, so I think uh, let's move on here because then this connects to what we're about to mm-hmm. say. Uh, we see here as we recognize that Ahsoka's in this world between worlds. Um, we start hearing faint voices in the distance mm-hmm. saying, "Hello, Snips. I didn't expect to see you so soon," and it's none other than our boy. The the chosen one, <laughs> the um, the king of Star one Wars. who the king of Star Wars, the one who brought balance to the Force. It's Anakin Skywalker, and we see or him walking it? up from the back, and he's smiling at her. And the episode ends, and then there's an interesting moment here as we hear the Vader theme. Mm-hmm. It's the last thing you hear, and then cut to black. Great ending to the show. Fantastic ending. So yeah, now this opens up a bunch of questions based on what you just said about the world between worlds. What is this? What's going on here? What do you think? It could be so much. I, I've seen a lot of debate on this on Twitter since last night. And the big question is, the music at the end of the episode is a hint. Because yes. you would not throw that in there for no reason. Going, dun, 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 and then it cuts off immediately. So I think it's meant to make the audience uneasy. Is she actually seeing Anakin or is this an illusion? Is she being tricked? Mm. Is this because one somebody pointed out they were like, okay, we're in the world between worlds. If this is Anakin's ghost, why does he not look like a ghost? Why is he just normal Anakin? Why are there no like glowy effects? Why is he still in his revenge of the Sith robes? When when you see him as a redeemed person, He's in these lighter robes and he's got like his normal hands. He doesn't have his mechanicals hand, mechanical hands. Now, there's a lot that could happen here. This could be Ahsoka as she remembers Anakin. So she's seeing the Anakin that, that she saw last before he turned evil. So that's a possibility. The also the, Another possibility is this is a dark side vision and she's being tricked. Um, somebody brought up that because Ahsoka has such a close connection with the daughter, could this be the son trying to trick her? Which, if that's the case, if that's the case, your average audience viewer isn't going to know who the, the son is, so they would have to explain that, and they would have to explain, like, the Mortis gods and all that stuff, so I don't know how complicated we could get here. I hope it's Anakin, but there are a lot of, like, I hope it's just purely Anakin, but that does bring up a lot of questions. Somebody else also pointed out, they said it could be Anakin from a specific moment in time. It could be Anakin before Revenge of the Sith. And yeah. he somehow... What I was thinking initially right after finishing it the second time was, what if it's... Is that really him? Or is it maybe him uh, post Turn to the Dark Side? Yeah. Uh, Anakin. And that's where the Vader theme plays. And maybe it's just a way for Ahsoka to see it's a vision she's having that... Nothing she could have done would have changed what he was, his destiny, essentially. Yeah. Like, he was always supposed to do what he did. And so, like, if, if your explanation of the world between worlds makes this make sense, because it's like everything is happening all at once, everything that's meant to be is meant to be, and, like, 
if maybe she'll see some kind of vision if, if she did stop him, which there is a rumor that we will see her on Mustafar with him. Um, all these other things that would have happened. And so she has to let that play out the way it did mm-hmm. kind of thing. So that's kind of where I'm at with it. I mean, also his lightsaber looks weird. I don't know what's going on with that. Could be overanalyzing it here. But. Yeah, but the the Vader Q is, I think, meant to make us uneasy. I think it's meant to make us go, wait a minute. Is that actually him? Because I think that there's a possibility that this is a trick. A trick from who? I don't know, specifically. I don't know. I don't know if it's a... There could be a larger looming thing at hand that we're not entirely aware of. I mean... I would love to think that there's going to be a Mortis connection somehow, but I just don't know how they're going, how they would do that when half of their audience doesn't even know what the hell the Mortis arc was. So, like, I I think the theory of it, maybe it's the son tricking um, Ahsoka because Ahsoka is the manifestation of the daughter. Ahsoka is the manifestation of the light. She was saved by the light side of the Force. And where there's light, there's always dark. And the Mortis gods are the portal to the world between worlds. So there is a good reason to believe that there would be a connection there. But I Mm. don't know if they're going to bring that in, they would have to explain that to their audience. That's another thing that they have yet to explain. And I don't know if they really have time for that. I do think, I do think that this could just be Anakin, but it does bring up, I think his robes are questionable. The fact that they didn't put him in the light side robes. I think that the lightsaber hilt thing that people were pointing out is a little suspicious. And I think the cue is extremely suspicious. And it's meant to mislead us. Yeah. But, I mean, like, if it is just Anakin, I would not be bothered by that at all. I would just be like, oh, my God. Like, <laughs> they need to talk and hash out some stuff. But I don't know. There's yeah. a lot of different directions they could go here. What's um, your- I mean, this was just an amazing ending to the show. Super hype. I think everyone was really happy with it. And I think, I think I'm think i sticking with my theory. My, I'm sticking with my guns. Maybe it's just, like, a way to show her. Because it's probably a lot of guilt that she's carried. What do you think? It's like him time. being like, "You need to see this." Like, do you think it's I don't actually know that it's him? Even him? It's just maybe she's there, and it's like maybe she's manifesting it or something. I don't know. I don't know enough about the world between worlds, but like, <laughs> what are the rules of this see, place? I think, I think she's going to see a lot of these visions in the next episode. She'll be in the world between worlds and see some of these flashback scenes. I think that's what we're going to see. What if the next episode see is that just... it was always meant to be the way yeah. it played out, so she doesn't feel guilty. You know. Well. What if what if the next episode is just all Clone Wars flashbacks and all different outcomes from all of these different uh, yeah, that's what, what I'm if saying. realities? I think that's what it's like, going to be. It's going to be – I don't think what if necessarily. I think it's just going to be like what happened. Like it's going to show live action uh, interpretations of her and our boy. <laughs> our, I would boy love it if Hayden. it's just Anakin and then they have a conversation because I do think that there's a conversation that needs to be had between them. About yeah, maybe he's like the ghost of Christmas past, present, or past or present or future. Ghost of Christmas present, where it's just kind of he was just kind of showing her like, look, what's up? How's it going? I didn't. Sorry for killing all those kids. <laughs> um, <laughs> let me show you around a little bit. Let me show you. You know, this is. Let's catch up a little bit, but let me let me show you. This is how things have to be. This is how things are. You know. I I think too. It's like she needs to be released of her guilt. To get to Ahsoka the way, I think that this is her journey to purge herself of all of the crap that she's been carrying with her all of those years. And Anakin's going to be the person to help her to do it. Like, he's going to be the guiding force to be, like, potentially, if this is not a trick or, you know, it's not a dark side version of Anakin. If it's just Anakin, I think it could be a really beautiful journey of being like, you need to let this grief go. What happened, happened. I'm sorry. I hurt you. A lot of stuff went down but this is how it had to go yeah. and and her really coming to terms with that and you could really show like a, a really compelling beautiful story of of redemption yeah maybe atonement in a way totally uh either way i think next episode is going to be a banger and i think this was a very strong uh mid-season episode i think if anyone was doubting uh, or feeling iffy on the show, this should help bring bring you back a little bit. I am still, I still do have some concerns, like dialogue mm-hmm. for me still with the show. There's a couple characters like Hera and her stupid son Jason with a C and an E. 
Uh, I'm not totally sold on them, but Balin's really strong. Ray Stevenson's amazing. I'm so sad he's gone. I know, me too. He's such a strong suit here. I think, so let me give some final thoughts and then I want to give my rating as well. So super hyped for next week. I think this was really well directed. Um, Yeah, Peter Ramsey. We're seeing improvement in writing from Ahsoka and Sabine, I think, which is were kind of weak points for the show thus far. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, Ray Stevenson's the best. He can do nothing wrong. Shin is awesome. I think she's going to be really interesting to see. Like her anger, like mm. was really shown in this episode, and maybe he, he doesn't seem to be fully like committed to the Sith thing. So I think she could be a threat to even Balin later on. No, you think she um, might try to kill him or turn against maybe. him? Maybe she might like feel like he's holding her back and like maybe fully commit to dark side stuff. I don't know, but I think I hope she that's stays interesting. evil. Their dynamic is interesting. Like very cool. <laughs> Um, Morgan, I don't know why she's bossing everyone around. That kind of annoys me. Balin's way cooler. Seems like he has his head on straight. Um, Anakin, Anakin's obviously the highlight of this. This is amazing. Um, and I'm really excited to see where that goes. Now, for a rating, I'm pretty high on this. I'm pretty... This is one of the better Star Wars episodes we've seen. I'm, I'm, I'm going maybe like 8.6. Pretty high. Pretty darn high. Only thing is like points off for uh length i'm always going to complain about length if we don't have over 40 minute episodes like sorry make them longer Uh, there's no excuse to not have longer episodes and some of the dialogue at the beginning i didn't like love love but yeah this was a high high rated episode for me and by the way so everyone gets my ratings it's like so hard to get into the nines like you have to have one of the most perfect episodes of tv ever Mm -hmm. so like breaking bad season five uh what's it called uh God, I'm forgetting the name of the episode. But Bra- the, the Breaking Bad episode five when they're in the desert. I don't want to give anything away if you haven't seen it, but the one with Uncle Hank and uh, Walt. That's like, uh, oh, it's Mandias, I think is what it's called. Mm-hmm. I think that's what it's called. Um, that's like a 9.5, 9.8, but that's like one of the best episodes of TV of all time. So 8.6 for me is it's pretty high, dude. Yeah, I think so. I, I mean... This episode in comparison to the first three, I think, is a lot higher. So I think the rankings for the first three for me, probably looking back on it now, would be a lot lower. I think this is probably, yeah, in 8.7, 8.8, maybe even in 8.9. I just think that, like, I I really see a huge shift from this episode from the first three episode. I, I really think that this one was on an entirely different level. I think a lot of it was due to Peter Ramsey's directing. I think he's directed some of the better episodes of Mandalorian. He directed, um, remember, remember Green Vegetable Dude in Mando season three? Oh, uh, yeah. He directed yeah. one of the episodes with Green Vegetable Man. And I remember I really liked it, the way it played out, the way it played out with like the action specifically. I think Peter Ramsey's really good at action scenes. Yeah. I I've noticed that really that's a common this. thread. I, th- I think he did a good job with that in uh, Mandalorian season three, too, with like Bo-Katan and the her merry band of Mandalorians taking back uh, Mandalore. So yeah. I really think his I think his directing really helped elevate this episode a lot. I really enjoyed the second half of this episode so much. It's really great. Like when Rosario gets to shine, I think she shines. I just want to see them give her more because I don't know if they've necessarily made her extremely likable, but I see a lot of improvements from the first three episodes, and I'm hopeful for where it's going to go. There's a lot they could do next week, and I really think that next week's going to be a pretty big deal for the Star Wars fandom. I mean, for God's sake, they're releasing it in theaters, and it's yeah. a Dave Filoni directed episode, so you know some shit's going to go down. Yeah, high, high hopes. And it's 50 minutes, sure. isn't it? Yeah, I think so. So we're in good shape for next week, dude. It's going to be awesome if I can watch it <laughs> when it comes out. I'm going to – I, here. dude, your baby is probably – I mean, if you induce that baby on Monday, you're going to be out for the count, and I'm going to have to control myself and not try to spoil anything because well, I have – I might be able to watch figure. it. Like, maybe I'll be in the hospital board. I don't know. But I just won't be able to do a reaction. I don't That's know. That's so true. That's um, so true. Let's get into some viewer questions. Do we have yeah. any of those? Yeah, we do. <sighs> I'm on the uh, community page right now. Mm. Um, Natalie W2965 says, what an episode is right. Beyond the bias of Rebel Star Wars fan of me, I think this was objectively well-written, well-paced, and beautifully shot episode. All the elements are clicking into place nicely, and the tone is exactly what I want it to be for the material they're covering. 
Not a single character feels out of place. I don't really have any notes, which might sound trite, but I don't care. People can nitpick and tear the show apart if it's, it's their prerogative, but I'm having a damn good time with it, and it makes me a very happy Star Wars fan. I haven't been this excited for weekly episode drops in quite some time. Well, that's good. That's good to hear from Natalie, uh, 2965. I have to um, agree I disagree with, her with on... I disagree Oof. with the not a single character feels out of place. I, there, Jason with a C and an E. <laughs> feel a little out of place. Um, and I'm, I, I'm not totally convinced on Hera yet. Not to say I'm going to sit here and nitpick and, and, and get angry about everything. I just, you know, from a well-rounded perspective, I don't, I don't feel like they're quite there yet. But I am enjoying the show. I'm not, you know, I'm. I agree with ninety percent of this comment. I think. I think something that Natalie brings up is that I really agree with is I haven't been this excited for weekly Star Wars episodes in a while. Mm. Actually, that's a very good point. Not since honestly, Obi Wan maybe Obi Wan. I, I was excited. Now that's not an them. excitement I've had in a long time. <laughs> I, I have to time. agree. I'm. I'm genuinely yeah. looking forward to watching Ahsoka. Every week, and it and it feels like that somebody behind this actually cares about how mm. it turns out, which is very nice. Whereas, like a lot of the other shows, have been just pumping out content for the sake of pumping out content. At least this feels intentional with what it's trying to do. And I'm having yeah. fun. I'm I'm honestly having fun with it too. Um, yeah. And I want to see it do super well. I I hope they continue to carry the tone. I think the tone shift is the the best thing about this episode, and I'm really excited to see the direction it goes now. I agree. I think you hit the nail on the head there. Um, Dart Kick 04 said tension and build up to the final fight and reveal was great. Haven't had that in ages. Yes. Yes. Good tension build mm-hmm. up. The one thing, though, I felt like, I don't know, maybe I'm overthinking this a little bit, but like this episode felt like a huge, uh, it was a huge deal, obviously, right? And it, mm-hmm. like this fight that, that Balin had with Ahsoka. Um, I don't know, like, Maybe I am just overthinking it a bit, but um, I just felt like there could have been more tension built up to that. Like, it feels like we needed an episode in between. You know what I mean? Uh, or maybe for... I think maybe the other, maybe it was just the other episode needed to be longer and like the one right before this. And there needed to be a little bit more stuff that happened in between where there was like a lot of tension between Shin and Sabine and Ahsoka and Balin, where it's like, I'm going to have to face him at some point kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And then they finally meet. You know, I just feel like there was maybe some a gap there there's definitely uh, some tight tightening they could have done if there's anything i've noticed with this show so far it's just they need to do tiny things to tighten up scenes that's yeah. honestly it. it's like they it's not a lot they have to do but there's definitely some like little moments where they could throw in some extra dialogue or just add a look or something to tie the whole scene together to make it flow better but i'm i'm almost under the impression that last week's episode and this episode could have been combined into one one hour episode like they didn't need to split them. Actually, that would have that would have fixed everything, in my opinion. It would have made it an awesome episode too. Mm-hmm. Like it would have made it a banger of an episode if that was the case. So maybe that's what it was missing for me. Like it just felt like there wasn't that much build up, and it's because like we just kind of picked up where the, exactly where the last episode left off. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was it's still like this yeah. was a great, a really strong episode overall. Um. 9LJM2 writes, random takeaway, but Balin's fighting style and stance reminds me of the Jedi Knight games where he had the ability to switch between heavy, Mm. fast, and light and middle balance style, which is definitely using the heavy style. I really enjoy that. That's a throwback game for sure. Really fun. Another minor thing was Ahsoka's head grab when she hears Snips is very similar to her sense in Order 66 in the Clone Wars. We didn't talk about Snips. Mm. But overall, very much enjoyed this episode of Morak was a Night Witcher resurrected by one by one. Uh, we did talk about snips. I, I, I think I'm I'm we... just I'm just saying that that when when he first said snips, it was like perfect blend of Matt Lanter and Hayden Christensen. It, mm. it like felt like both of their voices were molded into one. It was perfect and iconic, and I was screaming, crying, throwing up. Um, what's the question? Yeah, I agree on the Ahsoka head grab, kind of like how she did in the Clone Wars. I really like that too. I also like Rosario's facial expression change, like the second she hears. Um, hey Snips, I don't, I didn't think I'd see you so soon. Like she has this moment of like, oh my god, <laughs> like, yeah. And it was just nice to see that. It was, it was, it was really cool. Um, was Maraca Night Witch or resurrected, or was he resurrected by Morgan? I think he was a dead Inquisitor that was resurrected by Morgan to suit uh, what they needed him for. 
and he served his purpose. He was like kind of Shin's boyfriend, but then also kind of just like a cool <laughs> little warrior. As you wish. <laughs> he, he definitely isn't Star Killer. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Um, Jonas the Dad 2742 says, Bruh, needed this level three episodes ago. What, needed this level? Needed this level three episodes ago. Read that with the wrong tone of voice. Yeah, um, I think I they could have definitely given this energy uh, a little bit earlier, but I'm really happy with the tonal change here. It was really good. Um, the guy 519 says, Wow, this was so amazing. Concur. Yes, it was. Preston4871 says, I guess she was the fallen Jedi. Tear face, tear face. Uh, Hardy har har. That's a mad she joke. Fell. She um, fell. It's a classic mad joke. Bipolar Weasel says, I don't know. Stopped watching. Too slow. Wooden acting. So did you not watch this you wanna, episode? You want to elaborate there, buddy? <laughs> like, <laughs> you want to you wanna give a little bit more detail as to why you Some you're people that just way? like they... they hate on they love to hate star wars uh I, yeah um i don't agree i i think there you know there's something to be said about the acting but i don't think it's bad i think it's more of the writing choices the dialogue choices mm-hmm. um and you you picked a bad episode to stop watching <laughs> yeah I mean, this is this is the one that made me feel a lot better because up until this point, like, again, I've enjoyed the show. I just haven't been like, yeah, all right, let's go. But I think this episode really was like, all right, let's get down yeah. to business. Let's go. Totally. Let's switch it up. Overall, look, it was great. We love it. And I think we're just stoked for next week. And I think that's the biggest takeaway from this for me is like I'm looking forward to watching the episode next week i think it's going to be great i like the characters they've i like what they've done with these these characters i think there's been a tone shift in terms of rosario dawson's portrayal of ahsoka Balin is super intriguing to me we have yet to get to thrawn and ezra we have anakin back there's a lot that is left to be wanted so i'm mm-hmm. really looking forward to next week so overall i'm excited um i think the show this was a much needed episode mm-hmm. for this show and I, I i have high hopes for the next few so that's it for me. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I I really I final thoughts. I am very much looking forward to next week and I think it can only go up from here. The fact that we got the Anakin this soon is is telling me we have yet to see a lot and we no longer are watching any old footage from the trailers. We're getting all new stuff from here on out. We honestly have no idea what's in store, and that's extremely exciting. So I'm really looking Definitely. forward to seeing what they do next week. And all around good time. But guys, what did you think of this episode? Were you also screaming, crying, throwing up? I God, that moment where I went back and I edited our reaction of being like, <gasps> it's Anakin Skywalker, holy shit. I, it's such a good feeling when they throw that stuff in there. It just, it brings out the kid in me. And honestly, dude, I'm not gonna lie. When I rewatched this episode today and when I rewatched it like at one in the morning, I got a little teary-eyed where I was like, there's something about the feeling of the prequels that they have not been able to replicate since. Yeah. They've come close, but they've never really been able to portray the vibe that it gives you. But whenever I see Hayden Christensen, it's like, I'm there. Like, I'm back. Like I think they did with Obi-Wan and Anakin in the Obi-Wan show. That was There was a couple moments there. It felt very prequely to me. Um, mm-hmm. That's the most excited I've been about Star Wars was their duels. Uh, and those are going to be hard for me, hard to top for me. Um, but this, I agree with you. This was very good. They've done an excellent job across the board. They're hitting their stride in terms of these little things, the music, cinematography, the acting, the um, not relying on the volume so much. <laughs> yeah, there were a couple um, shots that were, that were a little volumey in this episode, but I didn't think it was like to a point yeah. where it killed me. But um, guys, what did you think? Leave a note in the comments below. Are you excited for next week? What are your theories on Anakin? Let us know below. Like, subscribe if you're new Thank you for joining us. If you joined the stream last night, we'll try to do it again next week. I'm expecting a baby any minute now, so I might not be able to join. But Melissa will definitely be here to watch the very exciting fifth episode of Ahsoka. So thanks for joining us today, and we will see you next time for Star Wars Podcast. Possibly. 
Possibly. With you. Possibly. No, maybe. Maybe Matt. I don't know, guys. Thoughts, prayers, yeah. good vibes only for Matt and his yeah. wife and his impending baby girl. So mm-hmm. that is very exciting stuff. But until the next episode or reaction video, whatever we do, um, may the force be with you and have a wonderful day, guys. Thanks for watching. 